1976, this voyaging canoe was built for New Zealander James Sears. Its purpose was to sail 1,500 miles across the Pacific from the Gilbert Islands to Fiji. The aim of this journey was to prove that in pre-European times, the Pacific Islanders had the technology and the seafaring ability to purposefully navigate the Pacific Ocean. And they were, as Peter Buck had described them, Vikings of the Sunrise. The Gilbert Islands are remote and unaffected. Here, many of the traditional skills involving the building of canoes have not been lost. Tarawa is the principal island of the group, and it was at the village of Taratai at the north that our canoe was built. Fourteen villagers and their wives built the bow room. The men did the hard, heavy work their wives patiently made string from coconut husk. And it was this string that held the canoe together. After three months of sea trials, Taratai was ready for departure. The scope of our voyage excited the Gilbertese. They gave us a special send-off, remarking on both the luck and courage of our crew. For the crew, it was a tremendous moment. They had built the Baurua, now they would sail it as their forefathers had voyaged in the dawn of Pacific history. Surrounded by a magnificent escort of racing canoes, we ran up to Lagoon. On board with us for the first few miles were special guests. They had helped with our project. We admired the speed and superb handling of the racing canoes, which made us look clumsy. The difference between these canoes and those made hundreds of years ago is confined mainly to the paint used for decoration and to the cotton canvas sails, which have replaced sails made from pandanus mat. Among our guests was John Smith, the governor of the Gilbert Islands. The Gilberts were one of the last of the British colonies. It was his job to prepare them for independence. He was not the usual formal desk type and would sail the first 100 mile leg of the voyage. As our guests left us, the small canoes dropped back. We put Taratai on a new tack for the open sea. The Pacific remained a mystery until 455 years ago, when Magellan unexpectedly burst into it. To his amazement, he found that others had got there many centuries before him. In 1519, he set out from Spain, crossed the Atlantic, and then sailed south along the unexplored coast of South America. In 1520, he found the strait that now bears his name. He crossed the Pacific too far north, making only two landfalls. Magellan died tragically in the Philippines after taking part in a civil war. But those who followed after him found populated islands. The mystery of how the islanders had reached their remote home soon became the cause of intense speculation. 
At the turn of the 20th century, there were four principal theories as to how the Pacific was populated. The most popular held that the migration came from Southeast Asia, perhaps as early as 25,000 years ago, and that Melanesia, which means Black Islands, was the first region of human settlement in Oceania. By this route, it was possible to reach the New Hebrides without having to sail more than 300 miles from land and seldom out of its sight. The first great obstacle to this supposed movement was the gap between the Hebrides and Fiji. Micronesia, which means small islands, received voyages from the Philippines, Indonesia, and the islands north of New Guinea about 3000 BC. Polynesia, which means many islands, saw the first Tongan and Samoan settlement more than three and a half thousand years ago. From there, the settlers moved northwest to the Alice Islands, north to the Tokelaus, and east to the Marquesas about 2,000 years ago. 500 years later, Marquesan explorers reached Tahiti, Easter Island, and then Hawaii and New Zealand. The second theory held that a lighter-skinned, Malay-type people we know as Polynesians came in through Micronesia to Samoa. From this base, they quickly settled Tonga, the many islands in between, pushed east to the islands around Tahiti, and from this base to such distant places as New Zealand, Easter Island and Hawaii. The third theory supposed that the Polynesian race was a mixture of North and South Americans. The South Americans came in on balsa wood rafts from Peru to Easter Island and eventually to Tahiti, only to be met by a wave of new migrants coming down from the North American coast to Hawaii and Tahiti. Thor Heyerdahl drifted a raft from Peru in 1947 to support this theory. The fourth theory, now no longer current, held that a vast continent submerged, leaving New Zealand isolated with a remnant population which eventually repeopled the Pacific. It was in Fiji where Melanesia, Micronesia and Polynesia converged that the canoe of Oceania was to reach its most impressive development. A careful examination of its features showed an adaptation of the Micronesian canoe design, proving beyond doubt contact between Fiji and Micronesia. But what did our voyage have to do with all this? We were on our way from Tarawa to Fiji to provide physical evidence of the historic link between the two island groups. At the same time, we would demonstrate the long-range capacity of the oceanic canoe and the willingness, even in these times of remote villages, to undertake such a voyage. Almost immediately from the time we entered into the open sea, I began to learn from Gilberti's law. Our captain, Tenenor, was adamant that the current was running to the east. The charts showed that it was running in the opposite direction. But sextant sights proved Tenenor was correct. How did he know? By the way the sea was behaving. On the second day, Tananoa announced we had passed the island of Mayana at two o'clock in the morning because birds had flown out from land to look at the canoe. The dead reckoning plot showed he was right again. It was another observation of a native navigator which would help him find the land he was looking for. Our last landfall in the Gilberts was at the largest island of the group, Tabatuea. The elders sent a canoe to intercept us to insist we come to stay. We took on provisions, uncertain of our next stop, we were careful to take as much water as possible, but it was a hard job because it had to be fetched in buckets from a small well more than a mile away. We will help you, the people said, and made the task easy.
Tabitawea Lagoon also proved a vast storehouse of food. The fish, not used to spear guns, were easily caught to be dried and salted. But even without guns, our crew quickly picked up a large quantity of small succulent clams. They were to serve us well. lavished us with hospitality. The intensity of the dancing, which expressed the tremendous pride they felt on the courage of our crew, moved some of them to tears. When it came time to leave, they gave us large quantities of coconuts, sennet string, and a special type of long-lasting food made from pandanus fruit. The elders also gave us their conch shell, and this was a very special gift, because it was the same shell that was used on their last voyaging canoe. We will blow your food wherever we go, so that the sound of your village will be heard throughout the world, I told them. And once more we were on the open sea. For our crew it was a particularly significant moment. They were leaving their home islands and all that was dear to them ahead lay the uncertain, the unknown. We sailed much as their ancestors sailed, and we lived much as their ancestors lived. The coconut was our staple, though we had some modern luxuries, such as cabin bread biscuits. Another luxury was fresh fish, eaten raw, while it was still almost flapping. The head and bones were boiled for soup. Our day settled into a simple routine. We stood watches on the oar and bailed water. In between times, Peter Barton and I played chess. Peter was our navigator. He was a naval architect from England, and I knew that his assessment of the performance of the canoe would be one of the most important aspects of the voyage. Peter tried to learn as much as he could from our Gilbertese navigator. At other times we discussed the work of David Lewis. David found that in some parts of the Pacific, 
pre-European navigation was still being used. When he sailed with us earlier in Tarawa, David said that Pacific Islanders possessed a complex, highly accurate system of navigation which allowed them to make distant landfalls. But how were they able to do this without sextants, chronometers and compass? They did have, a, in spite of that, a sophisticated system of natural navigation by natural signs without instruments. And uh, a system which is very, very old, that almost certainly was rooted in the seas of Asia, was developed in the big gulfs of the Indian Ocean, the South China Sea, and the waters of Indonesia before people really moved out into the open Pacific, something like 1500 BC. I think the basis is, uh, you might say, a compass, which is provided by the points on the horizon where known stars rise and set, because that's always the same point, though at different times uh, during the year. But um, this does provide a precise horizon compass uh, where these stars or their substitutes are used to give exact steering directions. In the daytime, the sun, the changing bearings of the sun is assessed very accurately. Uh, the lines of the ocean waves, the swells, and even the wind, which is more temporary, is used to keep on course. And at night or in thick weather, people steer by the feel of the swells passing under the ship. Native navigators are trained to observe and interpret natural phenomena. Seabirds such as frigates, terns and noddies indicate the direction of their island homes when heading for their fishing grounds at dawn and returning to their roosts at dusk. Another island indicator is cumulus cloud billowing thousands of feet skywards on warm updrafts while smaller clouds drift away to the sea. Light green reflected on the underside of clouds points to a distant lagoon. Deep water blue changing to green betrays a familiar reef while driftwood hints that land lies to windward. The main ocean swell bends around the island and bounces back creating swell patterns that reveal an unseen island's bearing. Meeting the reflected swell at an angle, the navigator turns into it towards land. All these signs expand to pinpoint landfall to a diameter of 50 to 60 miles. In island groups, the circles overlap, forming a screen hundreds of miles wide. A voyager can aim for the center of the chain and then change course after spotting familiar land. stars indicate the direction of islands beyond the horizon. But the navigator has to take into account wind and current. By allowing for leeway and current set from experience, he can sail a curving course to his unseen destination. Two days after we left Tabatawea, we were struck by a storm. The worst of it happened at night. It smashed one of our masts, poured hundreds of gallons of water into the hull, and severely wrenched the lashings. But the canoe survived. The storm ended before dawn. We got underway again under a sullen sky. The broken mast was prepared for repair. Our crew adzed, planed, and then lashed the two pieces together as their forefathers had done for centuries. And they did it with a great deal of humor. deck planks for a giant splint to make sure the mast would last, and it did.
The next crisis occurred two days later. Peter announced we were in the teeth of a powerful west-going current. It was taking us 50 miles off course each day. There was no chance of making landfall in Punafuti. Instead, we would attempt to sail 700 miles to Rotuma. Our supplies of food and water were inadequate for a prolonged voyage. The storm had wrenched the lashings. We did not know if the canoe was strong enough. But even before I asked the question, I knew what the crew would say. And they did. They replied, we do not wish to go back. The current which was taking us off course only lasted three days. We now had a mild sea and a favorable breeze. But we still had to live with minor problems. The halyard broke, dropping the sail into the sea. Rather than lose several hours of good sailing, Tananoa asked one of the crew to climb the mast. Sire went up more than 10 meters, holding the rope between his teeth. He had no assistance. It was one of the most outstanding feats of strength I had ever witnessed. On the 11th day, we sighted Rotuma. By four in the morning, with a favorable wind, we were certain of landfall. But there was no jubilation. The crew, who had not slept, quietly joined the helmsman and sang. It was a moment of the most intense emotion. For the Gilbertese, Rotuma was an amazing experience. The cliffs, hills and lush vegetation were a stark contrast to their own flat, sandy atolls. There was also overwhelming hospitality from the local people. The islanders traveled for miles to look at the canoe and to ask our crew to their homes. Their hospitality extended even to mending our clothes. We remained in Rotuma for 11 days. Finally, it was time to go. After three days, we were off Fiji, sighting the distinctive rock on the island of Waia in the Asawa group at dawn. It took another three days to reach the mainland. Finally, we slipped in quietly into our anchorage in Latoka. And what had we proved? We had shown that such voyages were very much possible, not with experienced yachtsmen to whom the outside world is a reality, but with villagers to whom it is very much a mystery. We had reaffirmed the ancient sea link between Fiji and Micronesia and demonstrated that the voyaging canoe, though held together only with string, had survived the 1,500 miles of open sea. Above all, with our adventure, we had paid tribute to the people whose seafaring capacity had made the vast Pacific Ocean their undisputed highway and had rightly earned them the title, Vikings of the Sunrise.
Four months after Taratai arrived at Fiji, she arrived in Wellington, New Zealand aboard the Fremantle Star. The canoe is now the property of the National Museum Wellington, and it has the long-term prospect of being on permanent display in a hall specially devoted to oceanic canoes.